Hey y'all, and welcome to Geospatial Experiences. I'm your host, Melissa Mayo, and I'm an Esri engineer on the product team. This podcast focuses on the application of geographic information. Let's go on a journey together with some of my amazing coworkers, along with Esri customers, partners, and distributors who are doing really cool work in the field of GIS. For this episode of Geospatial Experiences, I'm interviewing someone who I've known and respected for a long time, Brock Long. Brock was the director of Alabama Emergency Management Agency when I was hired there. Since then, he's gone on to be the administrator of FEMA and an executive chairman at Haggerty Consulting, along with many other wonderful things. Brock, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on today. How you doing, Melissa? It's been so long since our virtual Alabama days. The cutting edge of trying to understand GIS in the emergency management world, right? I know, right. But you were always so positive and supportive about all things GIS. You really saw the vision even, you know, back then. You're one of those, one of the directors that I've had that has gotten it better than any of other, any of the others. Um, really understood it and could see the big picture for GIS. So that was always something I appreciated for, about working for you. Yeah, I enjoyed it. You guys had a great team down at Alabama Emergency Management Agency, little old Alabama, you know, it's, um, you know, a lot of times uh, people don't think it's the the focus of where innovations is taking place. But I, I really believe back in, gosh, was it 2007, 2008, when I came into office, we were really uh, doing some pretty innovative things through Homeland Security. It started out as Google Alabama and working with Google. And then we were figuring out that probably a better platform to go to an Esri-based type platform. And, you know, there's your little plug there, but that's what, that's what we started to do. And I think you and others started to introduce me to what else is possible? And, and you know, we, we really needed to have a way of warning our citizens on real-time information about the hazards and vulnerabilities and real-time weather. You know, if, if you could see what the weather patterns were doing and if I could just download my location, what no matter where I was, I could see what the watches and the warnings were to the weather that was coming through. And, you know, I really thought that we were, you know, leading um, – leading the nation at that time so and I know it's come a long way and um but anyway it's great to be on here today Melissa I appreciate you absolutely I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on I'm so excited for us to be able to walk through your journey and talk about the topics that we have lined up so we're going to jump in and I always start these by asking everybody about their you know their journey their geospatial journey and just kind of their career history so and, and you've definitely had an amazing career thus far so can you take us through your background and your career journey up to this point yeah, so I think, um, you know, going back to the Alabama, before I was at Alabama, um, I was a hurricane program manager in FEMA Region 4, Atlanta. You know, and so for those of you listening in, that's uh, the six coastal states from basically Mississippi all the way to North Carolina. And part of that program was um, running what was called the SLOSH program, you know, and uh, essentially storm surge, trying to understand storm surge vulnerability and you know, and really digitizing those and making those maps, you know, um, you know, be able to help to do a, a number of things with uh, designing evacuation zones to warning the public about how high the ocean was going to rise in specific areas and, you know, being able to overlay a ton of data, housing data, whatever it may be, infrastructure data within those. And um, we've come a long way since that time, but that was really my first taste was FEMA Region 4 working with uh, GIS. And then we carried that over to Alabama and uh, we got into some arguments on the best platform to use between the Google world and everything else. I don't even know if Google is still <laughs> really, really doing a whole lot in that world, but the, um, but, but, but it, it's a necessary thing to really help us understand risk and vulnerability risk and vulnerabilities help people to visualize the threats um, that are there because right now, like you, you take the hurricane world, Melissa, hurricanes are defined by wind, but that's not really what's going to kill you. Uh, you know, storm surge has the highest, the highest potential to kill the most amount of people and cause the most amount of damage. You know, flooding is involved there. There, you know, wind is definitely a factor. Uh, if there are no building codes, you know, those types of things. So, you know, I, I really started to learn, you know, about GIS and the value that it brings uh, way back in the day, um, early 2000s, and uh, trying to figure it out. Well, I, I just remember, you know, I was coming in, I had the GIS background and experience, but I was new to emergency management. And so you posed questions to me and said, hey, how do we, how can we map some of these things so that we can see, you know, and, and, and see this bigger picture? And it got me thinking about things in different ways. You know, it really was super foundational for me and and think, you know, 
all of that were things that I took with me throughout my career and said, hey, when Brock talked about this and when we made these maps and when I did this stuff with Brock, it just really, you know, I even took it with me to the power company and it's still kind of in the background of my mind now. So it's it's funny how things that someone like you can just ask questions about or can, you know, want to want to see something in a different way. And it just it resonates and stays stays with you, you know, for yeah. Well, I think I think the challenge, you know, when we, when it was first coming up, is uh, you you almost had to be a rocket scientist to put together the data sets and the maps and everything that took place and so forth. <laughs> Most emergency managers in the country, it was like, oh my gosh, I mean, it was overwhelming. Just just spit out the end product for me. This is what I need to see. And so I don't think you know people realize the amount of work and and the the sets that went through and. You know, and then Hazus was coming about, Hazards US, you know, that was coming about at the same time. And um, and, and trying to understand the loss estimations that Hazus produced. And, you know, it was really junk in, junk out. If you had junk data going in, then it produced a junk out, you know, estimate um, that could be way off or um, well beneath what, what Mother Nature was doing at that time. So I, I wanted to ask too, have you have you just always been interested in kind of that emergency management space? I know that's really been, you know, the, kind of an underlying theme throughout your career. Has that just been something you were interested in from the get-go or, or how did you find your way you know, to great, it? Great question. I mean, one, I say every time I change jobs, something catastrophic happens. Uh, if you look through my career, I, I was able to, I was able to get in on the ground floor, um, you know, of emergency management. So I left uh, Appalachian State University with, uh, I, I did graduate, undergrad and graduate school there. In 99, I left and um, I didn't want to go into city county management. I had offers to be a budget analyst for the city of Asheville, North Carolina. And I thought, man, if I became a budget analyst, I'd throw myself off the building eventually, <laughs> you know, um, you not what I wanted to do, it. right? And um, not what I wanted to do. And so I had, um, was fortunate enough to find an internship in New Hanover County, Wilmington, North Carolina, which was one of the first FEMA Project Impact communities pilot programs. And Project Impact was huge. It was it was really the first focus, first time FEMA focused under James Lee Witt about mitigation and understanding those threats. And so, started my career there. Um, I ended up going to the Georgia Emergency Management Agency and doing school university safety and then became the hurricane program manager. So I got really involved with understanding storm surge vulnerability. And back then it was all static maps that took forever to update and upgrade. And it was dang near impossible to take those maps and explain to people how high the ocean was going to rise. You know, and we were trying to do those. And um, I interviewed with FEMA Region 4 on the morning of 9-11. I uh, became the... Wow. Yeah, I was the uh, hurricane program specialist. I was named hurricane program specialist after that interview and then got uh, promoted to hurricane program manager in 2004 when Florida got hit with four storms in six weeks, four major hurricanes in six weeks. So it was Charlie Francis, Ivan Jean, and then um, and then the following year was Katrina, right? Katrina and Rita and Ike and all those storms. And so finally after that, uh, FEMA was a tough place to be. Uh, they were just so beat up. And, and scapegoated for so many things that were well outside their control that I left, went into the private sector, and then I got a phone call out of the blue to go to Alabama. Uh, and that's where I met you. So, I, you know, Governor Bob Riley, I was 32 years old at the time. And um, I think I was the youngest state director in the country and got the job, didn't know anybody in Alabama. And and uh, then I was there and we got some unique we got some unique events. It was uh, 2009. We ranked number one in the nation, Melissa, for the number of declared disasters, uh, federally declared disasters across the country. And then we got the BPD Water Horizon oil rig explosion where we were introduced to what was known, I think it was known models, you know, at that time, right, about how the oil was going to flow and, you know, flow and, you know, and, at different le levels of the ocean and where we were most likely to find, you know, oil hitting the beaches. And, you know, the media would get a hold of those maps and funny enough, before I forget, and, you know, they would show a map that they, they did not know how to interpret. And it would sit there and say, there's going to be crashing waves of oil all over the Alabama coast. And then people would hear that, see that it was being misinterpreted. They didn't know how to understand that map. And people literally checked, you know, canceled their reservations for the summer, turned around, went home and Alabama suffered from the standpoint of sales tax revenue and everything else that year, because People were reading those maps, Melissa, and totally misconstruing everything about them, right? And so you got to be careful about the data you put in the media's hands as well. 
and how it's being interpreted. But then um, left Alabama, went to Haggerty Consulting as executive vice president for six years. And then I got a phone call out of the blue to go serve my country as FEMA administrator from 2017, 2019. And, um, you know, it, you know, again, um, I was Senate confirmed 95 to four, uh, four negative votes, uh, you know, which is great, you know, considering the hypersensitive politics. But the um, thing about it was, is that I was in office for two months, Melissa, and then Harvey, Irma, Maria, the California wildfires, Florence, Michael, uh, we had Hurricane U2 in the Western Pacific that wiped out Tinian and Saipan that nobody's ever heard of. You know, there was an Alaska earthquake, there was a volcano in Hawaii. I mean, it was just nonstop. So if you look at all the data, Melissa, it's something we can talk about is, you know, all the recovery dollars that are going to go out to fix those communities as a result of the two years I was there is more than the nine previous FEMA administrators before me combined, right? And so- It was uh, crazy. That was the yeah. time period. For and then- uh, yeah. I resigned uh, right before COVID happened and went back to Haggerty Consulting as executive chairman where I am today. So, yeah, so that's that's a snapshot. <laughs> you got hit with all the big stuff everywhere, everywhere you went, Brock, everywhere you go. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, so, definitely well, a you know, and, 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 you know, it's interesting throughout my career, you see GIS evolve, right? And then it's all about risk vulnerability in our world. And now it's about social trends and, you know, trying to figure out where people are and what they're doing, you know, those types of things too. So it's, uh, it really has evolved quite a bit. And then the, the applications, the, the, introduction, the, the introduction of applications that made maps speak volumes in, in quick fashion, you know, it's easy access, which is also awesome because it used to take, like I said, a rocket scientist like you to produce a map in several hours of running you know, data and everything else. So we've come a long way. Oh, I don't know that I count as rocket science. We have some really rocket science level people at Israel. I just figured out how to click the buttons during that time frame. <laughs> Brock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. You know, I'm just thinking about it. You've seen so much during your career and you were, you know, you were really young when you came in to be the director at Alabama EMA um, and did an amazing job when you were there. And, you know, you've moved on to other, other roles and positions and, and you just you built this career and you've shouldered this responsibility in emergency management, you know, and with moving through the response efforts at the state level, at, you know, the federal level, at, you know, managing all these things. What's it like for you personally and professionally to have that kind of responsibility? Because I don't know if people think about how it is when all of that falls on your shoulders. You know, everyone's looking at you when we have these big events. So, well, um. Anybody that politics to be the female administrator has no idea what they're getting into. <laughs> and I'm not so sure they're the best fit, right? It's, um, you know, for me, I got a phone call to go serve my country. And it was funny because General Kelly called me and he said, Brock, why do you want to leave this beautiful, you know, why do you want to leave beautiful Hickory, North Carolina, where I currently live? Why do you want to leave beautiful Hickory, North Carolina and come work in this cesspool up here in D.C. that I got to deal with every day? And I said, General, I don't. <laughs> and, uh you know, there was a laugh and everything else. And then it was, uh, what would you do to lead FEMA? You know, what, you know, what are your thoughts on leading FEMA? And we, and it, it became a very serious conversation. I don't think people uh, realize how large FEMA is and the, more importantly, the jurisdiction in which it serves. You know, the, the agency watches over half the globe. So Tinian and Saipan to the Western Pacific, all the way to the U.S. Virgin Islands. And you know, when I think back to the number of wildfires and declared disasters, it's like something new happens every three days in that office. But you only really hear about the ones where things don't go well and or as well as the, 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 the media and the public should really understand that. And so I've always said that there's a successful formula for disaster preparedness, mitigation, response and recovery. Right. There's a there's a there's a successful formula that you can describe when emergency management is working correctly. And it's like a chair with four legs, right? So, so imagine the, the seat that you're sitting in is your community. That is Alabama, that is DC, that's the United States of America, right? And the four legs that support it represent different things. The first leg is a true culture of preparedness within our citizenry that does not exist. I mean, let's face it, Melissa, we're we're lacking tangible skills this day. You can you can graduate some of the high, most prestigious universities in the country and still not know how to do CPR, swim, um, 
do first aid or invest a dollar in the stock market for your retirement in the future, right? And so in some cases, you know, you know, really that that cultural preparedness is a lack of insurance as well as a huge piece of this, right? Underinsured, lack of insurance, don't know how to be insured because I don't understand fully the threats, it, particularly if you move from one one state to another part of the country or whatever else. You don't know what, you know, you're buying. You, you know, nobody's educated you on the different hazards that, that, that you know, that they can present themselves. So the one leg of the chair is true cultural preparedness in our citizenry, right? The second leg is a strong state and local government capability in emergency management, okay? The third leg is the private infrastructure owners who own 85% of everything we depend on. Some, some studies would say up to 85%. I would argue that it's greater. For example, FEMA doesn't own a single bit of infrastructure in this country. Who owns the infrastructure, for example, in Alabama? Your former employer, uh, Alabama Power, owns the power grid. That's not FEMA. FEMA doesn't say, hey, Alabama Power, let me put your power grid back up. That's not how that works, right? And, you know, so so really it's the, the, the infrastructure owners is that third leg, right? And then the fourth leg is the firepower of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the federal government marshaling services down through a governor, ultimately to the local level. And so when you think about the stability of this chair, if you remove one leg, it's unstable. If you remove two, it's totally broken. And, and you know, the, the disasters that make the news and go really bad is when FEMA is the only leg of that chair attached. Katrina, um, you know, Katrina, Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico, you know, no doubt. Um, you know, and so and, and that, that applies to small disasters that don't make the news for the most part in communities where everybody's upset as well. And so we've really got to do what we can. How do we use GIS to make sure that all four of those legs are bolted onto that that seat so that it's a more stable environment and safer, right? Does that make sense? It does. Um, do you feel like people, you know, even as individuals need to take a more serious look at their piece of that as opposed to having so much reliance on, okay, FEMA's going to rescue us, the state's going to rescue us, you know, well, do, do we need to look closer at what is our part in this whole oh, four legged no doubt. Process? No doubt. Um, you know, I, I have to be careful because sometimes I stand on my soapbox, you know, a little bit. Um, I have to be careful. I, I, I say this because I do care about people. I mean, I've spent, you know, 25 years of my career trying to keep people safe and taking care of them after, you know, disasters, those types of things. Um, the federal government can only do so much, Melissa. And the more prepared that people are in their household, the better they are to, to to be able to respond and recover from anything that impacts them. And so I'll take a an interesting storm uh, that hit, I call it the Forgotten Cat 4 in Florida called Hurricane Irma and, um, when I first took office in 2017. So you had um, Harvey hit Texas, you know, a ton of flooding there. Then Irma, then Maria, and then the California wildfires start popping off, right? And, uh, you know, and, you know, it's a, you know, so, I mean, from a logistical standpoint, um, we didn't have enough people in FEMA to be able to service multi-billion dollar disasters all over the country. So we have to be able to start building an army at different levels, you know, and stop looking at citizens as liabilities and start incorporating them into our efforts, right? You know, even down to the simple things as saying, hey, you know, Melissa, go check on your neighbor, <laughs> you know, neighbor helping neighbor. People don't know their neighbors anymore. But you're going to want to know them when it all hits the fan, right? And mm -hmm. and so one of the things that was interesting to me about the 2007 event, that 17 event in Irma, was we registered more people in individual assistance in FEMA in Florida that year than we did in California, Texas, and Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands combined. So you sit back and you go, wait a minute. Florida is supposed to be this gold star prepared state, you know, get a plan, do all this stuff. But what happens is, is that we go through our cultural preparedness, you know, public awareness campaigns of get a kit, buy supplies, blah, blah, blah. Nobody says really um, be properly insured. <laughs> and and that's tough because, you know, immediately everybody goes, well, yeah, but everybody's pulling out. Well, there's a reason for that. You know, there's a reason insurance companies are pulling out. But when it, you know, but when it came down to why we register people in individual assistance, it was it was cut and dry. You are uninsured and you you had damages to your home. So let's break that down. You know, um, 
you know, through GIS, how do we understand social capability when it comes to the monetary financial resiliency piece, right? Which is huge. If you're telling people to buy supplies for three to five days and that's an unrealistic ask, well, so is being properly insured. But insurance is going to fix you first. And so I'd rather people stop buying three to five days worth of supplies and being properly insured first. And, you know, the whole I can't get insurance, that's a whole nother battle that we don't have enough time to talk about. Um, but, you know, but but at that point, when you think of all this money that's out there from the, you know, the Infrastructure Improvements Act and everything else, Melissa, we should be. Who is leading the conversation in this country of how are we using a trillion dollars right now and all this FEMA money? to ultimately help communities buy down risk and and get the insurance companies back to the table. Like stop pointing the finger at the insurance companies. Like if we know a climate is changing and we know that hurricanes happen on, there's climate variability along with climate change. And then there's all these other, you've got another societal problem where people are, and what was happening in Florida was people were selling homes in New York or they're, you know, maybe they're leaving California, maybe they're leaving wherever. And they're selling an expensive home and they're buying a house for cash in Florida and they're not sure what they're buying. Nobody's ever educated them that this home was built before the building codes were upgraded in 2001. Probably not a good buy. You know, nobody's going to educate them on that because we want to sell homes and build homes as quickly as we can to the to the you know lowest cost standard. We can do it right and so what they would do, Melissa, is they would literally sell their home, buy a house for cash, and because by law they don't have to keep insurance on it, when the hurricane came or the waters rose and washed it away, now they're homeless. And there's no insurance package to really back that up, right? And so that's what's going on all, all over the world. So it's it's a tough conversation to have, and it's not a feel-good conversation that people want to have. But how does GIS help us see that data and that vulnerability so that we can get better and tailor some of those cultural preparedness um, problems that we're having. And by the way, how many people starve to death in Alabama after a tornado or a flood or a hurricane? None. But we're still yeah, asking yeah. them to, you know, and I believe in being self-sufficient because, you know, in some cases, logistics can fail. And we saw some of that in COVID. But I mean, nobody starved to death, but yet we're still focused primarily on go buy three to five days worth of supplies and not focused on where the major part of the problem is. So we, it re we really need to look at how the messaging needs to be changing and how um, we need to be educating people better for being able to properly rebuild when something happens. Because it's not a matter of, you know, is it going to happen? It's when it's going to happen. Or how do you take a hurricane track with the air cone, um, with the wind, you know, vulnerabilities, maximum and maximum storm surge, whatever, maximum radius of winds, whatever, wind gusts, whatever. How do you overlay these tracks and then see the financial resiliency, social vulnerability data too, so that if I have limited resources to send out after the fact, then I'm concentrating my staff. I'm sending my staff to the area where people are going to need us the most. The communities are going to need us the most. We changed our tactics on and put a real emphasis and focus on financial resilience. And, you know, it's, it's funny when you think about community resilience data sets, I have never heard anybody talk about um, the average credit scores of a community. Okay. So let's, let's break this down until I met, a gentleman by the name of John Hope Bryant, who started OperationHope.org. And John Hope, um, I brought him in when the government shutdown occurred because we needed to understand financial resiliency and how to increase insurance, those types of things. Not, you know, not a government solution, but from an education standpoint, you know, I don't believe that bigger FEMA is going to help the problem, right? And so, we brought him in and John and I used to have really uh, interesting conversations on maybe maybe the credit score data is some of the most important data that you could look at. So Melissa, imagine, imagine you want to retire and you want to pick the right place to retire. Well, if the average credit score of that community has been trending down over a five-year period, right, then that means you're going to have an eroding tax base. You're going to have more demand for government service with less means, right? That also probably means things like there's going to be less insurance to the emergency manager, right? Like there's going to be a bigger individual assistance mission needed, a, new, a bigger shelter mission, a bigger whatever mission. 
You know, um, you start to see food deserts pop up if the credit scores go down. People have less means to spend money on high quality food, right? I mean, there's all kinds of things that could go just start cascading impacts and effects that go downward. And I'm not so sure that that's a community you want to live in. And I also think as an emergency manager, it's going to be a harder community to respond and recover in as time goes on. So what are the things we need to do to get that credit score going in the opposite direction over the next five to 10 years? And, you know, and that's a far greater problem than FEMA could ever, you know, could ever come about, you know, and how do we, you know, implement innovative parametric insurance programs? How do we start to allow depressed communities, economically depressed communities to be able to apply for FEMA mitigation grants to offset the cost of insurance, to kickstart more insurance growth, not do it for them and cover it for them indefinitely, but maybe start to set a baseline capability in a community, couple of the financial education, the Department of Labor should come in, you know, those types of things, increasing the available jobs. And then you see the community resilience go up. And one of the things that's really important to me from a Homeland Security uh, standpoint is home ownership. There's this debate now where people can't afford houses and maybe I should, maybe I should never own a house. I disagree with that. I think, I think that home ownership and ownership is incredibly important in a community because if there's home ownership, then there's ownership in the community and then in the businesses. And so John O'Brien, you know, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but we would we started to wonder if if an average credit score gets so high to a point you start to eradicate certain problems, particularly in the homeland security world. If there's too much ownership in a community, it's not going to burn to the ground, most likely. Right. And so how do you use this data and GIS to help city county managers and other and emergency managers understand from a social standpoint, from a resilient standpoint, how to get some of these trends going in the opposite direction. That's where you guys come in. I don't know that, but you know, how do you help make me smarter on public awareness campaigns or education efforts or um, when it gets bad, the response tactics piece, right? Mm -hmm. Who's going to need our services the most? Does that make sense? It does. This feels like you and I were chatting beforehand before we started recording about the community lifelines doctrine. And this this feels like that type of um, that type of work, that type of uh, engagement and just the uh, I'm trying to get my words together, Brock. I think about it. Just the investment in your community makes you want to make sure everything's going to be OK. It makes you want to have those things in place that will help you know, you be able to recover, help your neighbors be able to to get back on their feet. And just having that investment from, um, you know, the bigger community element as well, having individuals who are interested not only in their own houses and their own spot, but their neighborhood. And then as you get further out, further out, further out, and, so, you know, sort of those concentric circles growing as far as what's the interest level and where are they invested and what are they really pushing to be able to have support for. Is that, that's where my brain yeah. is tracking it? Am I, yeah. am I following? My yeah, so so what we started doing, and uh, you remember Jeff Byard, I brought him up. He's an Alabama guy too. Um, Love some Jeff. Love who, us some Jeff. Uh, yeah, Jeff is like a brother to me. And uh, he is probably one of the single greatest emergency managers I've ever met in my life. And um, he will be on my team anytime I go anywhere, <laughs> you know, particularly if it's a job like that. Um, you know, Jeff and I and some others started having some conversations after 2017 and saying, wait a minute, you know, we could never have guessed all these risks and all these vulnerabilities that are occurring. Nobody ever told me that there was so much rotting infrastructure in Puerto Rico uh, that was now going to be my responsibility to put back together from hospital systems to power grids to roads. And it's not just Puerto Rico. It's it's a it's several part pockets. I mean, listen, we've seen rotting infrastructure in Flint, Michigan. We've seen it in Jackson, Mississippi around water capability, right? So, I mean, you know, one, it was nobody ever briefs you on America's crumbling infrastructure and where it's really going to hurt when a run of the mill disaster strikes. And, you know, and so we started asking the question, Melissa, of one, how do we uncover this information? Like, how do we uncover this? And so I don't really care. And now some of the GIS purists are going to roll out of their chair when, when I say this, because, you know, a lot of where 
GIS started was in the risk and vulnerability and helping people visualize it, right? I mean, maybe I'm wrong on that, but in our world, it was helping to visualize the threats, right? Well, in today's world, the threat's changing so much. I don't, I don't know if we're ever going to be able to guess what's going to happen until the level it's going to happen. So I started changing it up in 2017. We introduced Doctrine to make sure that we were fine tuning where our resources were going and how we were utilizing things instead of just blindly going through our operational checklist. And, you know, because this is the way we've done business for the last 10 years, you know, this, you know, this emergency support function goes here, this emergency support for, for support function goes there and this is what they're focused on we simply started asking the question of what's got to be working in a community that if it's not working then people are dying or life routine is disrupted what's got to be working in a community if it's not working people are dying or life routine is disrupted now what is that melissa what's got to be working you gotta you gotta have your utilities in place power you fix power and, and power like most emergency managers in this country and citizens have no idea that power is a complex term. That is electric generation. That could be fuel. It could be natural gas. It could be public power authorities, private, you know, investor owned utilities. It could be, you know, you know, nuclear, clean, green, hydro, hydroelectric. I mean, you know, the, the, the bottom line is most people have no idea how power is generated, how it is transmitted and what you got to do to restore it. Right. And so, you know, power and fuel. Yes, it cuts across all the other all the other infrastructure. If it goes down, the other infrastructure is broken, right? If it goes, and if it comes back up, all the infrastructure starts to work, right? So, you know, we have to, as emergency managers, identify the things that have to be working. So, one, safety and security. Without safety and security, you cannot respond or recover. You can't have a viable school, church, home, whatever without it, right? That's one of the lifelines. You have to have food and water systems. Okay. So bulk water systems, not bottles of water, but who owns the bulk water systems and the, and the infrastructure to get it where you need it to go? The sewer systems, the water systems, logistical food supply chains. Who actually is in charge of getting food from the farm to the table? It's not FEMA. It's not the USDA. It's, uh, you know, who owns these logistical supply chains and how do you get in contact with them? Who has this data? right? Who has this data? And what does that infrastructure look like? And then, of course, you have communications. Communications is the biggest lesson learned in every disaster that goes wrong. 9-11, Katrina, again in Maria. You know, um, communications lessons learned is so important that it's, you know, it is the single greatest failure in most things, like even in marriage, right? I mean, like, you know, so you know, comms is incredibly important as much as the power is, Right. Without comms, you can't fix the power. Without comms, you can't fix anything else. So who owns the communications? Is it Verizon? Is it AT&T? And so like when you look back at uh, Hurricane Maria, for example, Puerto Rico, there was plenty of food on that island, despite what the media was saying. There was a 30-day food supply on the, on, the, on the island. You know what the problem is? We never had anybody map how much food was on that island on any given day and who owned it and where it was. The problem wasn't so much that there wasn't any food on the island, even though we concentrated on getting $2 billion more commodities in that island for whatever reason, because we thought we had to and we were chasing what the media was saying. The real problem in the lesson learned was we're not utilizing what's already in a community and identifying what's already in a community to help the emergency manager marshal that stuff out rather than just waiting on FEMA to set up a logistics several days later and bringing stuff in for life safety, life support, right? So, you know, there's a there's a lot of work to be done in that food and water arena to help, you know, from a GIS perspective on what's already in the community. So, you know, for example, if there's a 30-day food supply in Puerto Rico, there might be a six to three to six day supply in Hawaii. You definitely want to get stuck on Puerto Rico before you want to get stuck on Hawaii. All right. But again, we couldn't communicate in Puerto Rico where to go get the food because all the comms were down, but yet we were kicking the Verizons and AT&Ts off the first planes into Puerto Rico for the sake of food and water. And so we were hurting ourselves, right? Next is hospital systems, hospital and medical systems. Who owns that infrastructure? It's public owned. It's privately owned. There are you know, kidney dialysis centers. It's not just hospitals. It's like all these dialysis centers. It's effusion centers. It's everything. And so it's a massive infrastructure. So when you say health and medical, 
oh my gosh, how many maps is that? You know, digital, how many overlays is that? You're right. It's, uh, you know, and, and again, Melissa, who owns it? Who's most important? Who's down in real time? And who's the most important person to guide me as the emergency manager on how to get it back up and running? Right. I can't do, there's only so many things I could do, but what do you need for me to help you come back online? And then, you know, as you go through and start to identify those, the, the lifelines could be different for any community, different from California to Alabama or, you know, Montgomery to Sacramento. Who knows? Right. And so, you know, those lifelines, you've got to identify that. Then you've got to identify who owns that. And then they've got to be able to help you understand what response tactics you implement to get them back up and running so that the disaster is secure. But what we do is we spend a whole lot of time trying to figure out risk and vulnerabilities and how we're going to get what's going to hit us. And at the end of the day, I'm starting to think a little bit that that matters, but it's not the most important thing. Who would have ever guessed that a ship was going to lose its power and hit a bridge in Baltimore? Who would how are you ever going to guess all the different ways we can be attacked from cybersecurity standpoint? There's just no way. Right. And so. More importantly, I think when something's hit, you know, or something has to be working, then you mitigate it and then you 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 figure out the response tactics around it to get it back up when it's broken. And we learned that, again, in some of these events where you go out into the field, for example, you'll hear governors and local elected officials complain when the power doesn't come back on or the comms don't go back up in a timely fashion, you know, but yet. What those officials don't realize is, is that, hey, you know what? The county for the debris contractor actually shoved all the debris out of the roadway systems you told them to clear in front of the infrastructure so that these privately owned infrastructure owners can no longer access, you know, the comms and the power equipment that they need to access to get it back up and running. Your, your tactical mission of just setting out and blindly going through it just kept the power and comms down for, for more days than necessary. And so, you know, how do we use GIS to get smarter? But to me, you know, um, it, it's very simple. Your incident, your incident action plan should be, you know, maintain the, the community lifelines and it should be stabilize them and restore them. And that's what you should be doing and focusing all your resources on that. And again, trying to fix it in sequence as much as possible to do the greatest good, get the power back on, everything else might start working. This really feels like a shift in, kind of a shift in paradigm, a shift in thought process and kind of how you're looking at it from, you know, like you said, from the old, the old ways that we've done it in emergency management to a new way as far as, especially when you're thinking about when you're shifting from, okay, let me identify all these different risks and all these different vulnerabilities and all these different hazards and how we're going to respond to each one of those individually but more of like, you know, big picture of what do we need when anything happens? What mm -hmm. are these things that we've got to have? And who are the people that we really need to touch base with to make that happen? And how yeah. do we get them working together too? Because sometimes sure. you have issues with the different groups not wanting, not not necessarily working together, or they think they're, you know, they can think theirs is more important than the other. And it's hard to kind of get them working in concert too. Yeah. And then it goes back to the same with the public awareness campaigns. A one size fits all campaign doesn't work. I mean, we, you know, why do we keep doing them? You know, so how do you take the so social vulnerability data and really tailor a message plan through multiple channels to get the people to do the greatest good again? I mean, you know, and, and try to get people a little, a little more prepared you know, through figuring out low to, code, low to no cost ways of, of, of coming up. And, I, you know, and, and like on that side, I mean, part of me thinks that like when you look at all the volunteer organizations active in disaster, nobody's focused on financial resiliency for the most part until the last couple of years. And so mm -hmm. how do you marshal that in the communities, in the churches, community groups, whatever uh, education system is finally getting a clue that money's important, you know, understanding money is, you know, important. But, you know, how do you do that? And I think that GIS can help us do that. You know, um, one of the other areas that is truly perplexing that, um, you know, for example, there's, there's two things. One, we, in a minute, let's go back to COVID. Remind me about digital blueprints, okay, for COVID, right? Um, but one of the things that we did at Haggerty Consulting, for example, is, is that we are um, financial advisors to a governor. 
you know, so, th so think about it. When you get hit with a disaster, if it's really bad, there are 20 different federal government agencies that are funded to provide over 91 different recovery programs. Who has mapped that, Melissa? And, you know, I think recovery plans are laughable in this country. Like, they're not remotely indicative of what actually takes place um, from the day you're hit all the way 10 years later on all the money, how it flows down from different agencies how it's sequenced together, how do you avoid duplication, those types of things. And so, yes, there are Salesforce type, you know, databases and financial databases, accounting databases, but how do you visually help a governor, a mayor, you know, see these funding streams and how to use it to where you buy down risk and become more resilient in the future as a result of using this money in one way. And now when you look at like, all the multi-billion dollar disasters around the country. And then you look at all the COVID reimbursement money and all the different pots of money that came out. And then, oh, now we've got the Infrastructure Improvements and Jobs Act. Next thing you know, there's well over a trillion dollars being thrown out by the federal government with no plan. <laughs> and, you know, there's no real plan. Nobody is harnessing all of the funding that's out there using GIS or you know, AI or whatever it may be to say, if the country could please spend this money in this manner and focus on these community, like in my opinion, it should be focused on community lifelines, you know, then we'll be X amount, you know, more ready for the future, right? And so the other thing going back to the community lifelines, Melissa, was if these are the things that have to be working, that if they're not working and people are dying, then why aren't we concentrating day in and day out on fortifying them and mitigating them? So, you know, like right now, I mean, one of the biggest arguments in emergency management is, is a dollar spent in mitigation is the equivalent to six or seven dollars, you know, savings and recovery. That's total BS, <laughs> you know, like you know, it's total BS. Where did that number come from? No, because um, if that's the case, then why are disasters growing exponentially? What's that? So there's no real equation and no real actual relevancy no. to show that, that actually happens, right? No, and and if and if that's the case, then man, there's a lot of mitigating to do because I have not seen an improvement in the disaster cost. I've seen a nightmare occur where so much money is coming down, and yes, yeah, some things survive, but collectively, if we still have 51 off mitigation plans. What if we could take the community lifelines that we we define nationally, and there's seven or eight of them, right? What if this year we focused on power and fuel? Next year we focused on hospitals. Next year we focused on transportation systems. You know, the next year we focus on comms, and we start to show where we've truly bought down risk in each one of these different lifeline areas, and go back to Congress to say this is effective, because right now. Um, most cities and county look like a deer in headlights with all the money that's there. They don't have the human capital capability, the systems to manage all the funding that they may be entitled to, how to have the wherewithal to put it all together and sequence it together to avoid duplication and jump through all the hoops that the federal government provides on each different type of grant. And there's no way of measuring they're doing the greatest thing with it. So what happens like after COVID, like a lot of communities bought park benches, you know, I mean, you know, whatever, right? Just trying to have fun. Just trying to send it. I'm not trying to sound cynical. I'm trying to give your GIS uh, members here a vision for what really needs to happen. Yeah. You know, where you can really help. You know, Brock, when are you going to run for president? I feel like you have more vision than all of the presidential candidates combined most years. I feel like you need to get out there and do this and make make a difference, make it happen. You know, like PTA president, or <laughs> you know. No, I, I'm, uh, yeah, um, who knows? I don't, I don't think I'd win. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you're far too practical and you make too much sense, but we can't have that. Yeah, but, I, you know, it, it's tough because, you know, I never want to sound like the old guy standing on my lawn telling kids to get off of it, you know, that type of thing. But, um, you know, I, I really believe that emergency management has become like a rusty old bicycle that we keep strapping new parts to, right? And um, we're not really 
getting down to the root cause of our problems. And in some cases, we don't want to call a spade a spade as to why. Like, it's it's really easy to say, well, climate change is causing all of these disasters. Well, that's that's a part of it. But holy moly, I mean, we got people buying shoes that are more expensive than NFIP flood policies, but yet saying insurance is too expensive. I mean, you know, so it's it's one of those things where it's really tough to have that societal vulnerability conversation and then with the climate change piece you like i've never heard anybody put together on climate change if everybody could just do these one or two things it would make the greatest impact on saving our environment in the future you know like most people don't know what to do and nobody's giving them visualization and helping them understand what they can do on a day-to-day basis to solve such a big problem like climate change but right now we want to blame everything on climate change when actually um, the old rusty bicycle hasn't adapted, um, you know, very much in the last 20, 30 years. And so, and then the other thing too is, Melissa, take, take COVID. What has changed in the infrastructure as a result of going through COVID? Absolutely nothing, in my opinion, of, of consequence. So, you know, for example, um, you know, we're still incredibly dependent on foreign countries for all of our PPE and vaccine ingredients, all the stuff that goes on with it, right? I mean, what changed? What is our domestic production capability after going through COVID, you know, versus where it was before? And what should we produce domestically to safeguard this country, you know, in in future pandemics? What does the hospital infrastructure look like in the future as a result of going through this, there's never hospital vacancies because our entire hospital system is based on an insurance reimbursement model. So if you have vacancies, you're not getting hospital reinsurance, you're not getting, you know, insurance reimbursements to pay for the services. You know, how do you use GIS to help hospitals understand redundancy and logistical suppliers for the things that go in a hospital? If somebody really wants to become wealthy in the GIS world, when the, the U.S. government has declared a Defense Production Act or turned on the Defense Production Act, you know, to really produce things like, I don't know, ventilators. When the Ford Motor Company is like, we, we can build ventilators, just give us the directions. Well, OK, Melissa, who's got all these directions and blueprints in a digital warehouse? Rather than the federal government's way of bulky and just going and stockpiling everything, what if you created the digital warehouse that had the the, the The instructions of everything that goes in a hospital, a clinic, a a dialysis center ready to go. And me, you know, you and me, we just start selling it back to the federal government and everybody else, you know, to say, well, here it is. Here's how you develop a mask. Go. But it's going to cost you a thousand bucks, you know, whatever. Who knows? I mean, we need to be having, and I say that hypothetically, but like, where is it? You know, what's changed? And We don't do a very good job of lessons learned and after actions. We go through after actions, but everybody's tired and then nothing gets done. And that's really a a big contention point for me, Melissa, on on that type of stuff, right? I was just thinking about the after action reports and kind of going through that process. But, you know, I was was thinking too, we've been doing this emergency management thing for years and years, and we're still kind of doing it the same way. I mean, I'm sure there have been historical shifts and changes and that people have learned things here and there, but overall it feels like we're still doing it the same way. And it just doesn't feel like we're making any forward progress as far as how do we do this better and how do we, you know, uh, respond better in emergencies and how do we really shift our outlook on it, you know? All right. Maybe, maybe we wrap up with this, Melissa. Um, You know what the number one trigger, in my opinion, is to get a disaster declaration from the federal government after a tornado, a flood, whatever else? We can blame it all on climate change. And yes, I believe in a changing climate, no doubt. But what most people don't recognize is the business model of how you get a presidential disaster declaration. So what what's the first thing if you go back to your Alabama days? When when a disaster occurs, when a disaster occurs, we go out and immediately focus on the life safety and search and you know, the life safety mission, right? Okay, the life sustainability mission. But to get a public assistance-based declaration in this country, what are we looking for next? Do you remember that? Uh, for public assistance? We're have, I remember we had to look for certain numbers of businesses and certain numbers of, you know, for I, I know there were certain 
dollar levels that people had to hit for us to be able to trigger certain things on Plus, the wall. You were okay. looking for uninsured homes. You were looking for uninsured homes, right? Okay, on the individual assistance side. But to get the big money for the public assistance side, you were looking for uninsured public infrastructure. Okay. What a moral hazard. First yeah. of all, why is it uninsured? And why do we allow it, you know, infrastructure to go uninsured if it's insurable? If it's uninsurable, then maybe that's where FEMA comes in. But the most of the disaster declaration process is solely based on self-insured communities that do not insure their infrastructure so that when it's hit, libraries, public libraries, you know, public whatever capability, when it's hit and wiped out, if that amount of uninsured losses hits a certain threshold, then you're most likely to get a disaster declaration. But yet you as a homeowner with a mortgage have to, by law, have insurance on your house. So if you want to reduce the number of disaster declarations, then you increase infrastructure, insured infrastructure, as much as possible, right? And, and I, I know that there's some that's not. But if you want to help your emergency management director go after a disaster declaration, show them all the uninsured, uninsured infrastructure that's been busted up by whatever you get hit with. And show them that data and hand it over to FEMA and let them go verify it out in the field. And then you'll get a disaster declaration pretty quickly. Um, that's what I that's what I'd tell you to do in your emergency operations center. But sadly, that's how our whole system is worked. And yet, it's a moral hazard, in my opinion. I have a, I have a little bit of a segue question for you too. So I, you know, I teach part time for Lander University. I don't know if you remember Matt Malone. He worked for us at EMA as well. So I teach for oh, Matt. Yeah. Lander in their emergency management program. So what can what do Matt and I need to do? What do we need to be thinking about to help our students better understand kind of what all we've been talking about today and how to better prepare them as they go out in the world for their emergency management roles? Go back to the community lifelines doctor and understand it. Um, go back and let them know that you know public awareness campaigns aren't working to re you know rethink those. Um, We've really got to understand we got to stay away from the politics of why we think disasters are getting worse. And we need to drill down to the true causes, you know, the real causes. And um, it's not going to be changes that occur overnight. These are things like what are the things we can put in place now that will re make real differences five years from now. Um, if you're going to get into the world of emergency management, um, you know, you need to understand grants management and project management, you know. But right now, I mean. We don't have enough grants managers to help everybody understand what's out there, what they're entitled to, and how to sequence that money to ultimately buy down risk. And we don't have the systems to help people understand and model it yet. I mean, I'm sure it's coming, but, um, you know, the challenge with these systems, like like um, with these, these data systems that, that help people visualize is that, you know, the, the business model problem that, that GIS folks face is that, you know, these local counties and governments don't have big budgets, operational budgets to pay for these licenses and services that people think that they do, right? When they have money, it comes in the form of disaster recovery dollars, not in day-to-day -day blue sky operational dollars too. So they've got to, you know, how do we start to produce cost-effective systems that emergency managers can use and make them smarter and more tactical uh, in a way that they're not hurting the operation, but really helping doing the greatest good. I love that. Before we go, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about Haggerty. We haven't had a chance to talk about Haggerty too much yet. Would you like to take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about Haggerty and what, what Haggerty does? And, sure. Absolutely. And so, uh, yeah, so I've been fortunate to be with this company for 12 years and watch it grow from 15 people to uh, becoming a, a household nationwide name in Homeland Security, Emergency Management, and now Public Health. Um, and so our, our whole purpose as a consulting firm is to help public and private-based uh, clients um, you know, prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters. You know, we, we've got a big Blue Sky Day uh, preparedness and, and response capability that wants to help people understand their threats and vulnerabilities and how to properly be set up to manage large disasters and mitigate them as well. Um, and then when they do get hit, we want to be with them, you know, helping them navigate all those, all those funding streams that we've been talking about. And so, we have been with, um, we've done work all over the country from COVID reimbursements for 
uh, large states to helping people navigate multiple disasters that they've been hit with at any given time to now nav nav navigating all the federal funds management that's out there from the IJ. What are you entitled to? How do I grab that money and use it for the greatest good and buy down risk? So it's, um, but we, uh, you know, we, we're, we're nationwide and, and uh, that's what we do. Thanks, Melissa. It sounds like you stay with the with the clients throughout the process, not just the planning piece of it, but throughout the whole entire thing. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, one of a you know one of our clients, the longest lasting clients, is New York City. So uh, we came in um, after two thousand one when nine eleven occurred and helped them manage some of the recovery funding, and then we ended up being with them during Hurricane Sandy. Um, all the way through COVID and that, that bleeds into the preparedness arena where we're doing things with, um, you know, NYPD, uh, today to help them with exercise and training and different things. So, I mean, it's, um, you know, and that's, that's, we, we never want to be a fly by night, one time in one time out consulting firm. We want to be, a, you know, a part of your response capability. We want to augment your staff and provide you the technical expertise that you, you may be lacking in, for any situation that you face, whether it's, um, you know, mother nature or human caused disasters, whatever it may be. Is that kind of what makes Haggerty a little bit different than other consulting firms? You wanting to kind of stick with them and stay with them throughout the process and kind of what gravitates people to Haggerty? What is it that kind of draws them to, to the company? I mean, it's definitely the, the, the quality of our service and um you know we you know the 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 best customers you know are are the ones where repeat business continues to occur because of the, the way that we've helped them navigate you know uh, cradle to grave disasters and i think that uh we're always innovative i mean you know some of the work that we've done out in the field particularly in the recovery arena has led to policy changes at fema like we found better ways of doing cost estimating for example um you know and really leading leading them through. But, you know, my advice to any community is, is that you need to establish, and what we like to do with Haggerty is establish a pre-event contract where we're on standby for Blue Sky Day preparedness and planning needs, response needs. But when you get hit, we can, we can augment your staff. We can fill different positions within your emergency operations center to accountants, to grants managers, whatever you may need. And then literally be the arm that navigates you through recovery that helps you to avoid you know, negative deobligations. And, you know, we, we really proud ourselves on the fact that, you know, our clients don't see de negative deobligations when, when they, when they go with us, you know, through, through recovery. And we're not a fly by night company either. We've been around for a very long time. So over 20 years, over 20 years. It's impressive. And you guys have a really impressive client list of case studies too uh, available on the website. I'll make sure we put some uh, some of the links in the in the notes and everything too so that people can check Haggerty out and can look at those. And you guys do GIS as well. I've talked to Eileen several times over the years as far as trying to get people together and try to hunt some folks down that can respond out and things. So you guys definitely yeah. send folks out to supplement sure. for GIS as well. Yeah, we do the best GIS, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, Brock, I know I'm running over with time with you today. I, I appreciate you for coming on and chatting. Is there anything else you want to leave the listeners with here before we wrap up today? Um, yeah, you know, GIS is a big world. Emergency management's a big world. I always encourage uh, young and up-and-coming uh, folks in this industry to become an expert in something. Figure out what it is, what aspect, you know, um, you know, think about, you know, wonder about the problems that we need to solve and how to solve them, you know, with where you are and become an expert in it, you know, and and I think, um, you know, you know, if you become the recognized expert, your career will will uh, you'll, you'll climb through, uh, you know, you'll climb up in your career very quickly if you do that. I'm hearing you tell us to stay curious, Brock. That's right. Stay curious. <laughs> and, beca and become the best at it. So Stop Googling like everything I and start wondering and thinking through it. <laughs> I know, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Brock. I appreciate you. This has been amazing. I know you would be an incredible conversation. You'd be an incredible guest. So I really appreciate you spending time with me today. And I think everyone will learn a lot by listening to this episode. Thanks, Melissa. You take care. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I can't say enough good things about my conversation with Brock Long. Um, I have a stand a long-standing relationship with Brock. He and I worked together at Alabama EMA. He was my director and I was always just really impressed with how 
proactive and you know very interested he was in GIS. He's he he was absolutely a proponent for it when um, when I worked there when we worked together and. Um, you know, it was just really incredible to have someone at that level, of the, at the director level of the agency, to be keyed in on something that I was working on and to be excited about it and really wanting to um, use it as an effective tool to promote emergency management and to help the counties and help what we were doing and work really hard um, to be able to, to showcase um, and really, well, to showcase what we could do and to showcase how we could make improvements, but also... How can we respond better? What can we do to use GIS in such a fashion that allowed us to be better with our um, responses when we had emergency situations? And so um, I, I just absolutely love getting to reconnect with Brock and, and have, the, have this conversation. Anytime I get to listen to Brock talk, I just feel like I am able to just absorb all of his visionary, um, his visionary thoughts. He's so forward thinking in the field of emergency management. That has really become... Um, just an area, not only just something he's interested in, but he has a passion for. I think that comes through in this podcast and really anything you listen to that Brock does, that passion comes out. And so I just, I'm so excited and very appreciative to him for spending the time uh, to come on the podcast and share those thoughts with us. And I hope maybe, you know, that gets, you know, people's gears turning as far as emergency management and utilizing GIS and what can we be doing in the future and how can we be responding better and, you know, doing more efficient um, efforts in our response to, to disasters and ha- hazards and emergencies. So I, I loved this conversation so much. I was so excited when uh, Brock agreed, and I just, I really, really hope that everybody enjoys this conversation with him as much as I enjoyed having it with him. It was amazing to get to reconnect with him, and I just, I loved it so much. So thank you, Brock. That wraps up today's episode. Please feel free to reach out with your comments, or if you have an interesting topic that you would like to hear, please let us know. Thanks again for your time, and tune in for our next podcast.